Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our final research seminar of the semester. I must thank David and Jamie profusely for giving their time today because these are two very important, very much expert people in their fields, and I truly appreciate them coming to talk to us. Um, for those of you who have been here before, we've had an excellent lineup of speakers, so it's only fitting that we also end with a very exciting day where we'll be learning about how to write an outstanding journal article from the Dean of LSC Law and General Editor of the Modern Law Review, and we'll also be learning about the ins and outs of research fellowships, something I am particularly interested in since I would like to do one sometime soon, I suppose, from James Lee, who, by the way, gave me my first teaching opportunity um, in tort law at King's College London. He is currently the Vice Dean at Education at King's College London. So we're going to have David speak first, and David has said that is fine if you want to interrupt with your questions, you can raise your hand or you can put them in the chat, and I will be monitoring the chat, so feel free. Um, so rather than doing 20 minutes, 10 minutes for David, you can ask questions throughout. Then we will hand it over to Jamie, who will do his presentation presentation and he will let us know if he wants questions in between or we'd rather keep the questions to the end so when we get to Jamie we will do that so David you can take it away okay great well well thank you so much Emma it's, it's a, you know I'm really pleased to be able to come and uh, chat to you today um, about the modern law review about publishing the modern law review so I'm going to talk about the different components of that how it works how the process works um, you should just feel free just to just to jump in at any time pop your camera on ask a question and just interrupt me so uh, um, it probably that's probably the best way to do it to be honest with you because um, that you know we'll be dealing with those different components that I'm talking about so okay uh, model law review uh, so we are a, a generalist uh, 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 UK based journal um, we are very interested in uh, uh, UK work, uh, EU focus work, international work. We're also very interested in comparative and transnational work. Uh, comparative work generally needs um, a, a component that connects to uh, either the UK or the EU. So we generally wouldn't publish something that is a country study um, uh, that, that doesn't have any sort of connection and, uh, and insight into uh, uh, UK or, or EU law. Um, so uh, we have uh, uh, um, uh, several sections. We have an article section, which is our sort of premier section. We have a legislation section, uh, a case note section, and a reviews uh, section. Each of them have uh, different editors. Um, I'm going to focus largely on articles here, but I'm happy to take any questions on, 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 on the other sections. Um, so I guess, first of all, you know, get, try to give you a sense of, of, of what we're looking for with, a, with an MLR article. And that's, that's a pretty tough thing to, you know, we get asked this question quite often. It's a pretty tough question uh, to answer. And I guess a couple of highlights that might get that sense of, of, of what we're, we're looking for. Uh, we, we're not really looking for descriptive work. Uh, we're not looking for a, a descriptive account of the literature in a particular field uh, or, or, or just a survey of the case law in a particular field. Uh, although that survey and that literature review may be an important component part of, of an article, we're looking for an article that, that digs deep, if you like, that, that makes a compelling new argument about an area of law. Um, so uh, it's that it's that sense of a of a, of a compelling, well built, well structured, evidence based argument that that furthers our understanding of a particular area of law and law and and society. Um, and we're, we're open to all types of scholarship, all types of articles. Um, sometimes people think about the model law review as having a particular type of angle or focus, uh, but that's not how I see it, and I don't think that's how my editorial board sees it. We're open really to the best scholarship in any space, any field, with any interdisciplinary approach uh, or, or any you know, purely doctrinal approach. So we're just looking for the best scholarship in, in any particular area. And I guess if the I guess if there's one one word I think that tries to sum up what we're looking for, it, it's 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 critic well there's two words actually critically engaged. It really wants to push the field further than it currently is, uh, the, the, the not just to to account for the state of the field as it as it is uh, today. Um, so yeah, it's tough though to give you a very clear account of, of what, what an article. It, it, it actually is, but any any questions on that? Anything about the nature, the scope 
of what we do. So I did get a question that was sent in before via the registration form and somebody asked how how are they meant to um, pitch articles that are usually in a specialized field when it comes to a more generalist journal? How, yeah, basically that's what they asked. How are you meant to scope that or pitch that if you're usually in a more specialized field? It's a great question, it's a great question. So, so we are a generalist journal, but we're interested in any legal field. And, and, and that means that we can be interested in some of the most specialized areas of particular legal fields. So we're open to everything, even if you feel that it's very narrow, and very specialist, if it's interesting, if it's well done, if it's critically engaged, we're, we're very open to it. That said, as it, I think one of the key component parts of, of, of pitching something to a generalist journal is, is how you set the article up. Okay, you need to make sure it, it, with any article, even if you're going into the into the into the thickets of something narrow, you need to make sure you 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 slowly introduce the ideas, the concepts uh, uh, that, that 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 are going to be the foundations of the argument that you build in your piece, um, because you've got to remember that it will be read by people who will not be experts. So you've got to avoid that sense. Although to be honest with you, I think you should avoid that sense for myself when 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 pitching to specialist journals you should avoid as well you should avoid that sense of just entering a conversation that people are already part of and you should have you should avoid the assumption that that whole range of concepts and ideas are are given um uh, so that's that's key for us but as i say i generally think that's good practice uh, uh, uh more generally does that answer your question emma Yes, it does. Thank you very much. And I actually have another question as well. And this is on behalf of my dean, who unfortunately could not be here, but I know he'd want me to ask this question. And the question is, uh, what is your view on research metrics? So I know this takes you a bit off topic from where you were before, but I just know he would want me to ask that. Yeah, I'm very happy to, very happy to answer that. Um, we don't like them much. <laughs> Can't say I'm a big fan either, but yes, please continue. <laughs> So I think, um, I mean, it's, 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 you know, obviously we, 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 we focus upon uh, things like uh, um, our, you know, various factors that, 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 that the, the various Google Scholar metrics or, or, or the impact factors and things like that, uh, where we do decently, not as well as, as we would always uh, like to. Uh, uh, part of the reason why we don't always do so well is we have many different article types and some of them uh, uh, we wouldn't expect to be deployed, used by other scholars in other articles to the same extent. So, uh, and they're all counted as articles. So in that sense, you know, we, 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 we don't like them because we don't always do as well as we think we should do. Uh, and more generally from a perspective, from sort of the scholarship perspective, the way in which we judge each other through metrics like uh, uh, citations. Uh, so getting slightly away from the journal focus and more to the world, I suppose, of my, my other job as, as, as Dean of the Law School and thinking about, you know, what factors indicate whether someone is a successful scholar. Uh, there, when it comes to citations, etc., cetera, we're, we're, we're you're very skeptical that they tell us very much. Uh, given how poorly deployed they are and how misleading they can be in, in, in the legal field. I also know, of course, there are many other disciplines that share, share that view uh, uh, about citation. So uh, um, both when it comes to metrics for journals and citation indexes uh, uh, for scholars, I think skeptical on both fronts would be my answer. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, Emma. Okay, so if there's no other questions, I'll, I'll whiz on to our, uh, um, our, our submission process. So. We've done a lot of work on this in, in, in the MLR in the past few years to, 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 to make our admissions process, our submissions process rather, as robust as it possibly can be. And so we have now what we describe as a anonymous from the point of entry uh, uh, submission process. Um, and, and the process is designed uh, uh, to uh, ensure that scholars uh, 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 do not have any concerns whatsoever that there is any bias or preferential treatment for established scholars, et cetera, in our decision-making process. Uh, so, so this is how it works, um, uh, which I think many scholars find quite reassuring about the MLR. Um, so you submit your article, uh, uh, that article then goes uh, anonymized to uh, the articles editor. We have four articles editors. Uh, so the article's editor receives that article and does not know who the author is and has no identity information about the author whatsoever. Uh, the article's editor then sends that to a, uh, a committee expert who we call a desk reviewer. 
who reviews the article in a week to two weeks. Uh, and it's not a full review of the article. That desk review is just to decide whether or not it meets our bar for sending out to anonymous reviewers. Um, so, um, uh, and, and, and the desk reviewer also reviews the article anonymously. And the desk reviewer makes recommendations to the article's editor. If the desk reviewer says we should send this out for review, then the desk reviewer will make recommendations to the article's editor as to who the, as to who the referee should be which the article's editor almost always follows unless the referees say they can't do it. So, so, so anonymous point one, anonymous point two, and then at that point in time, if the desk reviewer says, yes, we should send this out for a review, they give the article's editor the referees, and then the, the article's editor at that point in time does find out who the author is uh, to make sure that we don't end up sending the article out to the author herself for a review or, or, or to anyone at her institution, for instance. And then the article's editor sends out the article to uh, the identified referees identified by the desk reviewer. Um, now, hopefully they say yes. Um, it, 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 now, sometimes they don't, in which case you've either got to go back to your desk re reviewer and get more, more, more suggestions, or sometimes, it's quite rare, uh, the article's editor will then have to make the call uh, him or herself as to who the re reviewer should be. The, the reviewers, of course, we look for two reviewers, of course, uh, they uh, are anonymous reviews. Uh, um, and and in the in, and then what we're looking for at the MLR is we're looking for two positive reviews. Okay, so to get through our submission process, you need two positive reviews. Um, if you don't get two positive reviews, it, it's it's almost always a rejection. Now that, that the positivity has a range, right? There are re reports that say you don't have to do anything with this article; it's brilliant. Publish it now. Or there are reviews that say, I really like this article, but it needs some changes. Both of those would count as positive reviews. If you've got two positive reviews, then you're in the zone of either an acceptance or a, uh, 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 an acceptance subject to uh, uh, minor revisions, or the revisions are extensive, an acceptance subject to major revisions. And maybe I'm slightly misstating that, but it's not really an acceptance subject to major revisions. That would be a revise and, and resubmit. You would go away, you would resubmit, and then it would go out uh, uh, to the same referees normally uh, to see whether they agree uh, that it should now be published. Um, now, in circumstances where, the, where, where you know, we have a, a very strong acceptance uh, and a, a, a rejection uh, 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 report, most of the time those articles will get rejected. Some of the time, depending on the nature of those reports, we might go to a third referee. Uh, uh, but that, that's relatively rare. So that, that, that takes quite a bit of time, right? So you, if you submit to the MLR, you have to be prepared that it does take quite a while, as with all journals, right? I recently submitted to uh, a, a major journal and it took uh, you know, eight or nine months to, before, I, before I got an answer. We're quicker than that at the MLR. We aim for 12 weeks. I think invariably it's more like, more like 16. So that, that's the review process. Um, I'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about the effects of that in a second, but I, I should stop there. Okay, so any questions? Okay, so just remind everyone, feel free to put the, the chat, the question in the general chat. You don't have to actually put it to me directly. Um, it's fine to put it in the general chat. But a question is, how do you make an article stand out for the MLR? Because we know the MLR is very much a prestigious journal. So how do you go about making a journal article really stand out to get past that review process and be published in this level of journal. And then I also see Jamie has a question. So Jamie, if you want to ask your question now as well. Well, should I, should I answer? Well, okay, sure, Jamie, you go ahead first and answer both. I, I was just going to add along the lines, having reviewed the MLR, um, I do think that sometimes people submit to leading generalist journals, including especially the MLR, because it's a leading generalist journal rather than perhaps thinking about why this particular generous journal beyond the fact that it's awesome and everyone uh, respects to publish in it. So the kind of kind of work that people are submitting that is still generalist and suitable, but the sort of tone or perspectives that people take, I don't think everybody always thinks this is an MLR article before they submit it, as opposed to I want to get it in the MLR, which isn't necessarily the same thing. And when I'm reviewing, and I think editors probably <laughs> similarly, you do partly think, uh, about fit in that kind of relevant sense, I think, um, as, as you know, you always want to publish leading scholarship, but do you think that kind of um, why this journal is often something people don't ask themselves enough before submission? Well, yeah, I, I guess, I guess to a degree, um, 
um, it's it's something with there's definitely people have an idea of what a, an MLR article is. I think some people and sometimes the reviews do too. I think we'd be trying to push a little bit away from it really as a journal in the sense of being more open and making it clear to everyone we're very open um, to, to all sorts of scholarship. Having over the years had a reputation for some types of scholarship, maybe in the regulatory space, for instance. Um, and, and, and that's resulted in colleagues not sending us their work in other spaces. So we've been trying to sort of shift that balance a, 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 a little bit um, um, to, to just be more open to, I guess, uh, you know, our, our statement on our, on our website now just says, you know, we're just interested in the best possible scholarship that there can be, um, regardless of what field it is in. But you're right, Jamie, still, even though we keep saying that, there is a sense of, uh, of you know, what, 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 what we are. Um, um, although it's sometimes for all of us rather difficult to articulate with 20 different members of the committee who have different views of what that is. Um, so for what, when it comes to what is a, yeah, how do you get over the bar? Well, <laughs> I mean, Jamie can talk to this too, right? It's, um, it's difficult to answer. It's, it's just, it's very difficult to answer. It, it, it goes really to the sort of the, the key points I mentioned at the beginning. Um, we are looking for, for the very best scholarship. And I'll talk a, a little bit about the, the difficulties of getting it accepted. Uh, and, and certainly the reviewers. So Jamie is, 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 has done a lot of reviews for us over the years. And we are so grateful. Um, and, 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 you know, when, when Jamie does a review, or anyone does a review, I think there's a sense that it's got to be really good. It's got to be a really high standard because what's really fabulous about our reviewers is that they take care of our reputation as well as we do. Right, so there they have a sense of, well, this is a good piece, it's good, but it's not quite good enough for the MLR uh, as, a top, as a top journal. Now, how, how you quantify and how you express that idea of being so good is really hard. Um, and I'm not sure I can uh, put it in, 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 in easily in, in words. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it I is mean, something that is hard to articulate. It is, but I, what I would just go back to is what I said before. So you've got to avoid you know, you've got to avoid it just being a descriptive account of, of or a survey um, uh, uh, or a country study. Um, it's 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 about um, it, it, it's about identifying a problem or, or in your legal space, a problem of understanding, a problem of, mis of, 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 of misconceiving something, a problem where the discipline as a whole has a consensus view and they're getting it wrong. And you dig down, you, 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 you undermine uh, these assumptions that you might find in the field. Uh, and you do so in a compelling way, in an evidence-based way, obviously great writing. Um, and, and often uh, using interdisciplinary methods, but not always. I, I, you know, I think Jamie's right. We do have a reputation for, for being in interdisciplinary space. But if the article is a doctrinal piece that does something really fabulous with that doctrinal space, then, it, then we're interested. Although doctrinal work can often, black letter work can often easily elide into the uh, 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 survey uh, 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 sort of type article, and there we're not interested. So. I guess that's probably, sorry, I forget the name of the question. I, it's probably as good as I can do to be as I, as I'm answering that question. Um, now, what I would say, though, in, in terms of getting there, right, which has nothing to do with the, with the MLR. Now, in terms of getting to that point where, you're, where your work is, 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 is of that standard, um, I think it's really important not to let it go too early, uh, right? It's, you know, you're young scholars. Um, it's really, really important to, um, to share your work with as many people as you can before you let it go. Um, and to encourage uh, the colleagues who you share your work with, not just to be nice, right? Uh, we have a tendency these days sometimes, you know, we don't want to upset people about their work or their arguments. Um, and, and it, but it's good, you want constructive feedback, tough feedback that says, I don't think that works. Um, so share it with as many people as possible, get them to read it, uh, present the work, even in a, in a formative stage, uh, get that feedback, rework, rework the article, leave it for a while, come back, rework it. Now, of course, at some point in time, you have to let it go. You can't be a perfectionist, but you should all be using each other in that process of, of, of improving the quality uh, of your work. Um, any other questions before I move on? I, I, I recognize I've only got about seven minutes or so to go. So, uh, uh, yes, so, so there was another question from the registration form. And in fact, this question is one that we've seen um, in other seminars where we have 
people who work in publishing as well. And the question is, are there any things you sh would say you should absolutely not do? So any things that straight off the bat would lead to rejection, it wouldn't be well received. Well, I think I'm in the zone of repeating myself here, if it's purely descriptive. If it's a country study, uh, they, they typically get rejected very quickly. So it could be an interesting country study. It could be a really interesting study about Brazil, uh, about the West Indies, about India, uh, about France. Um, but we wouldn't publish it because it's pure, it's a pure, it could be a fabulous country study, but it's not connected in any way to uh, uh, the UK or EU law. Uh, and so typically, and then that, so that would probably get rejected pretty quickly. Yeah, so makes a, sense. A, Thank a, you. A, a classic don'ts. Now, now, now let's just, uh, just dwell a, a little bit on, um, uh, which is connected to the last question about uh, uh, the quality that we demand and the quality that our reviewers demand. Um, we, we reject a lot of the articles. Um, so, you, you know, 70% 70, 70 of our articles don't get through desk review. So our, our experts on the panel, on, on, the, on the committee, we have a large committee, 22 members of the committee, actually 21, we're, we're about to point someone out soon, 22. So 22 members of the committee, we've got a broad range of expertise uh, and, and a, a desk review, a lot of articles get rejected. Now, when they get rejected, we typically try to give you some decent feedback. And, and I think we do pretty well there. We give you a paragraph of feedback uh, that, 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 that authors often, often really uh, appreciate. But it's, it's tough, first of all, to get through the desk review stage. Uh, and then it's tougher, of course, then to get through the acceptance uh, phase. Uh, we get over 300 uh, submissions to our article section alone each year. We have an acceptance rate that varies year on year out between sort of six to eight percent. Um, so so it's, it's not too terrible to get in, six to eight percent is not too bad, but obviously it, it's, still, it's still pretty tough. So the key thing then is about, about submission to a generalist journal like the MLR or other generalist journals uh, in the UK or elsewhere. The key thing is, you know, rejection will happen. Um, and and the key, it's key not to be disillusioned by rejection. Um, uh, all academics live the world of rejection. I know I do. Um, my life is, 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 is marked by rejection over the years, many, many times. Um, and I see Jamie's nodding his head there too. Jamie's also experienced rejection. You won't find many academics who do not experience it. And uh, I just say, you know, I really appreciate when seasoned academics say that, especially for like myself and other early career researchers, it's very good to know that rejection is something that happens because sometimes you think, oh my God, am I just not good at this job? <laughs> Like, is this normal? But then you hear that, in fact, it is part of the process. And I think once you try to learn from it, that's the main thing, right? Part of the process. And I think my, well, you know, I have an article which I actually really like, and it was rejected, I think, four or was it five times. Um, often in several of those times, it was by the same reviewer, which is a little bit problematic, but, but you just got to live in that hurts, right? That rejection letter comes in and your, you know, your heart beats faster and you're so cross and you read the reviews and often, you know, I, I you know, I'm not going to deny this. Often you read the reviews, at least in my own experience, and you think, well, they've not got what I was saying, or they've not been, they're not understanding that in a fair way. And, and that will often be true. Um, but I think it's what's key to remember is even if you don't like the rejection and you don't agree with it, which you could do, you, which you could not agree with it, fair enough, but it, it, there's always something you can learn from it, right? It, it tells you something about the way you've presented the argument or the way that you've not presented the argument. So take that rejection, rework the piece, send it out to colleagues again to get more feedback, and then send it on to somewhere else and keep going. You know, you simply can't give, give up. It's a... It is, it is demoralizing at times, but everybody experiences it. So, so, so you just gotta, it's, it's tough. It's part, it's one of the tough things about the job, right? I mean, we have one. And I think jobs. that advice also applies to the students who I see are in the room in terms of when you don't actually get the mark that you wanted on your coursework. And you think that we have marked you unfairly. Yeah. It's not always that. I mean, you might disagree, but it's to learn from the process and go forward. So I hope that's inspirational to you all, as I know you have your course for coming up very soon. It's always about, about learning from it. You may not always agree, but you, do, you will learn from it and you will get better for it. Um, so, so, yeah, so, 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 yeah, stay, stay positive through, through what times can we, and then one point, at some point in time, it, you know, that the acceptance arrives and, and you celebrate. And hopefully for many of you who submit to the MLR, the acceptance of the MLR will, will arrive. So, you know, I really do encourage you to submit to us. Um, um, it is tough to get in. I'm not going to deny it, but I think the process is a good one. You'll always get 
uh, feedback that's useful, I think. And very often the, the quality of the feedback that you actually get is brilliant. We have brilliant uh, uh, referees who, in, in my experience, produce fantastic work uh, for, for, for young scholars, especially. You know, we're often looking at getting two or three pages of, of notes on your work. So, so our, we view our role as not just producing what we, we think is the best, is one of the best journals in the world, uh, but our role is also, you know, supporting uh, uh, academics by trying to ensure that they get good feedback on their work. So send in your work. We'd love to have it. Well, that's really good to know, David, because that's definitely a learning experience because I have submitted, not to MLA yet, I'm, I will eventually when I feel that I've gotten to that stage and I, <laughs> I'm confident enough, but I have submitted some journals and I've gotten rejection without any feedback. So then I didn't know where to go from there. So I appreciate that even if you get rejected, you will get really good feedback because that is so helpful to know, okay, well, this is where I can improve or this is maybe I I thought I said it in this way, but the person didn't get what I was saying and maybe that's on me to change that. Right. So right. I appreciate so, that. Good. I mean, I should say on the desk review, the feedback will be more limited because mm -hmm. our colleagues are dealing with so many. You're generally looking at a paragraph, but when you get through to the review stage, then you'll be getting a couple of pages. That's really uh, good. In, 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 invariably. And of course, I can't guarantee that. Sometimes we get referees reports back that are a paragraph or two, but not, not, not very often. And just finally, Emma, before because I'm, I'm done with my time, although if, if you have any questions, happy to answer. Just in relation to your, your, your statement there about I'm not ready to submit to the MLR, well, I would always say, you know, my advice to young scholars has always been just go for it, right? There's just, there's, there's nothing lost. Um, there okay, nothing so I do lost. have a question on that. Let's say you thought something was good, but it didn't get through for whatever reason. There can be many reasons. There's no kind of like blacklist or anything like that, right? Because it's anonymous reviews, as in, let's say this year, it didn't work out for me because I need to improve some things. If I submit to a different cycle, there's no kind of list that flags you as having not done too well in the past, is there? Of course not. Of course not. No, no, <laughs> it's no, a true course. question I want well, to make sure well, about. Yeah, no, of course not. Absolutely, 100% no. Now, now, if we get, we do get some colleagues sometimes, you know, we have some examples, it's rare. We could be getting submissions from them three or four times a year. Okay, and, and, uh, to produce an MLR article, which is relatively long, I didn't mention that actually. We, you know, we, we, you know, we have a target range of sort of like twelve to sixteen thousand words, but sometimes we can publish seventeen or eighteen. We're a little longer than other journals. But to produce a, 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 an article sixteen thousand words long that is of MLR quality is a huge endeavor, right? It takes a long time. I mean, you know, for a young scholar, it's a, it's 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 their product for a year's work. So if we're getting, you know, three three submissions uh, uh, or four submissions a year from a scholar, and all of them are getting desk reviewed, we will say to that person, listen, you know, you need to spend more time. You know, there's no point in sending us this stuff. You're not spending enough time on your work. You know, do one piece instead of four. Uh, but no, no, 100% not a blacklist. Of course not. No, no, we, okay, we, we very are, good we to are know. Always, always open to submissions. Okay, no, but that totally makes sense. If you're sending that many per year, then you're definitely not putting enough time into it. So I appreciate that also there is no blacklist, but that people should also know that you don't want to just be pumping out things without the quality, because obviously it's the quality that we should all be aiming for. Yeah. Take your time, take your time. And I see a comment in the chat and you just said, very good to know that feedback is given with regards to subjective submissions. It's helpful to know where one went wrong and what improvements are needed. And since we are coming to the end, I'll ask if anyone else has any uh, questions that you'd like to ask David. Jason said, excellent advice, David, very helpful. Do we have any other questions? You can feel free to raise your hand or put them in the chat. Thank you, Jason. And hi, Jason. Looking forward to meeting you soon. We've had a few exchanges by email recently. So. Oh, great. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Good to meet you in person. Indeed. Okay. Well, but listen, also, uh, you know, if you have any other questions, feel free to, to, to send them my way by, by email. Um, I get a lot of emails, so if I don't reply, just, just write to me again. Great. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, David, for that insight. Um, I really appreciate it. And I'm sure everybody here appreciates it as well. You have really welcome. kind of shed light on the process and made it less intimidating as well, I think. So thank you for your time. And now we're going to hand over to Jamie to talk about thank research you. fellowships. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Emma. Uh, I I hope people can see my slides. Um, I've put together just a few slides to gather the thoughts and I'll um, send them by uh, email to Emma afterwards, happy for them to be made available to anyone. Um, so I'm uh, Jamie Lee, I'm the, the uh, 
Vice Dean for Education at the Dixon Prime School of Law, as Emma uh, mentioned, and I'm um, a general private lawyer, uh, and my interests are in tort and trust and restitution, but also uh, in legal institutions and legal change. So I'm a relatively broad generalist, um, and uh, um, Emma's asked me to speak about the ins and outs of research fellowships, particularly uh, visiting uh, other institutions. So how to go about it, uh, things to think about. What I'll try and do is compliment, um, I suppose compliment and compliment what uh, David has said, because uh, a lot of the uh, points he made about doing good work in journals is true of doing good work generally as an academic. So uh, asking yourself the right questions, uh, not doing things for the sake of it or because of um, perceived uh, prestige or whatever it might be, but what do you need to do in order to achieve uh, what you would like to in your career? Um, because I'm sharing slides and I've got uh, different screens, I'll um, talk through the slides and then take questions at the end, but do pop any questions into the uh, chat and we can uh, gather them all together. Uh, so, um, when it comes to visiting uh, fellowships, there are a number of different uh, schemes or, or means that it might be. So in some cases, there's external funding where you can apply to uh, funding councils or uh, charitable trusts, but uh, particularly given the uh, globally diverse audience we have for this talk, uh, where people uh, can get funding in order to go and visit uh, different institutions, uh, particularly in other countries, but also sometimes within uh, nations. Then uh, sometimes your own institution will give you uh, funding. Uh, that might be a, a regular research allowance or it might be specific funds you can apply for in order to deal with um, travel and subsistence uh, accommodation costs. Uh, equally, some institutions have funding to host people. Um, and I've uh, had a couple of those, been fortunate to have a couple of those in my uh, career. There's also then unfunded schemes. So you apply to be a visitor, but they don't offer uh, any funding. And so people uh, have to make their own um, arrangements for that. And then in addition, I know we, we have some uh, PhD students here, uh, Different institutions may have facilities for uh, PhD students to apply to spend a period of time uh, during their doctorate uh, visiting um, uh, a particular law school. So these are sorts of things people might be thinking about and they go um, through different levels of people's careers, the sorts of things people might be applying for. So some places might have visiting fellow, senior visiting fellow, professorial fellow, distinguished, awesome fellow, or whatever it might be. Um, so, uh, if we move on, I think the main thing to note is that it's important to start with an idea, right? and that can be uh, the idea for your career, right? the project that you want to work on uh, over the course of 40 years, or it can be an idea for a single article. And a lot of the challenge of academia is working out the size of your idea, which is which. <laughs> Some of those people think that uh, their first article needs to include all of the ideas they've had during their doctorate or, or during the early Part of their career, lots of caveats in the footnotes and so on. And then equally, sometimes people overestimate the size of their idea and it could be dealt with in a shorter uh, time frame. But what you want to do is to be thinking about the ideas you have for projects, maybe over the next five years, what work you want to be doing, and then how can uh, potential fellowships uh, help you with it. Now, uh, David uh, mentioned uh, the point of rejection and uh, a lot of visiting fellowships are competitive. Uh, next year, I'm going to be on uh, sabbatical and um, I've been very lucky to uh, secure a couple of visiting fellowships at uh, Oxford Colleges, but I also uh, didn't get some of the ones that I've applied for uh, at uh, institutions. Uh, rejection is part of it, but it's also uh, understanding there are lots of people who are applying, often all for the same ones because they're uh, offered roughly on the same cycle. So nobody can get all of them right? because you can only <laughs> Be visiting one institution at a time. So taking the time to look at which competitions are open to you and understanding that it will be uh, competitive and not to be unduly uh, disheartened. You know, if someone is more qualified than you and applies for the same thing, then they may want to get offered it, but they might not be able to accept it. So understanding that rejection will be part of this, but related to that, it does sort of tie into uh, how David was concluding with people over submitting submitting too frequently. Um, but this is true both for visiting fellowships and for academic jobs. Uh, increasingly, uh, in order partly to be transparent and um, fair to all 
people, there are more and more specific criteria for uh, academic jobs, but also for funding uh, schemes and visiting fellowships. And if you don't meet the essential criteria, you cannot be shortlisted, you cannot be made the award. So uh, when you're looking at schemes, ask yourself very carefully, do I, admittedly on a good day, but do I uh, plausibly meet the essential criteria here? Because if you don't, don't spend time applying for it because you won't be shortlisted. Uh, and you can spend your time on the ones you are eligible for. And you need to tell the story about how you do meet the criteria and make it as easy as possible uh, for the people reading it to see that you hit the points, right? whether it's the requisite qualifications, is a, is a PhD needed? Some schemes need a PhD, some don't. I myself don't have a PhD, um, but I wouldn't be eligible for ones that required one. Um, but seriously, looking very carefully at eligibility criteria or other criteria that are involved and only apply for ones that you uh, will be competitive for because you'll be ruled out simply um, out of hand if you don't meet the essential criteria. And uh, further reason to think about visiting fellowships is the time that it affords you. Often it will be um, uh, because someone's on research leave or has got a period when they can devote time to research, but uh, getting away, as I'll speak to in a moment, can give you extra time in the broader sense of space and being away from your home institution. So the email traffic and things is not of the quite, uh, quite the same order. But with time, it also uh, requires time to apply for these things, right? You have to uh, make sure that each application you make is tailored to the specific scheme. Now, it's not to say you come up with a different idea or you say different reasons why you're awesome in each uh, application statement. But what you do need to do is to make sure that you're speaking to the terms of each scheme uh, and the criteria of each scheme. So you can have your kind of general template, but you need to be engaging very specifically. And it's difficult, I think, to apply for too many schemes and still give them each the amount of attention that is needed. So a couple of other preliminary points, and then we'll come to um, some specifics. Uh, one of the great things about visiting fellowships is the ability to make connections across the world, and particularly in our discipline of law, uh, comparative, transnational, international perspectives can really enhance one's uh, work. And depending on your field of legal uh, scholarship, as I mentioned, I'm a uh, private lawyer, but people who work in uh, fields that are particularly international, transnationally focused, uh, visiting opportunities can be a great way to make particular connections. And related to that, partly as we come out of the pandemic, there's been greater use of uh, technology. And I think uh, institutions are looking at ways to diversify the groups of uh, people who can come and visit, uh, in some cases, creating virtual visiting schemes so that even if people can't travel, they can still uh, benefit. Most um, institutions adapted in some way during the pandemic, but retaining those uh, lessons, but also trying to uh, create meaningful opportunities to uh, widen participation. Uh, beyond um, uh, uh, common law jurisdictions, uh, for example, uh, looking to the global south and so on. Uh, these are important and thinking about the power of technology uh, to do this, but also what technology can't do, which is um, help with serendipity or give you the chance to have a chat over coffee in the, in the um, law school kitchen, for example. So thinking about are there any schemes where technology could help you uh, to get some of what you want, but also not thinking uh, that it's always a substitute for being able to go in person when, of course, that's uh, permitted. So uh, just a few more thoughts and then I want to leave plenty of time for questions. Always think about why you want to uh, apply for a research fellowship, why you want to make a visit. Right? So some of these I've mentioned, but it could be because there's someone you really want to collaborate with and you can only do that in person. It might be because they're looking for someone to support a particular project, for example. Uh, it could be getting the benefit of another perspective as a supervisor, if, particularly if you're a doctoral uh, student, but also just to get new perspectives from uh, going to a law school with different disciplinary expertise from your own, particularly uh, in law schools, because of the amount of law that we have to teach, uh, you know, the common subjects that are required for a law degree, uh, junior scholars, emerging scholars can often be maybe the only person in their broad field at their own institution. So visiting a place that has a a wider body of colleagues in that institution uh, is a way to get new perspectives, but also uh, to make connections and to meet people who do nothing uh, in your own area, but have that diversity. And I think particularly building on what David said, talking to people who aren't in your area 
is really good for enhancing your work for generalist journals because the audience of a generalist journal is people in your area but also people who aren't in your area and if you can talk to them about your work and why it matters uh, then that's the right sort of audience a couple of other reasons why you might want to uh, be visiting it could be because there are archives or particular resources at uh, a specific institution for example if you're a, a legal historian there might be a, a particular library um, at the institution that you're looking at where it's the only place you can do the work especially uh, one of those that's been a major challenge during the pandemic or it might be that you want to be doing comparative or empirical work in the particular jurisdiction and having a sponsor of an institution uh, can be uh, valuable or, or essential for such work I think um, but please don't apply for visiting fellowships simply because you think it should be on your CV right uh, if you think uh, that then it's not a sufficient reason by itself right? what you want to do is to produce good work and sometimes it will enhance your work to be doing a visiting fellowship but the mere fact that someone's been a visiting fellow somewhere doesn't uh, set them apart it's the quality of uh, the work that they have done so uh, when it comes to what project you might want to do you need to think about what you want to do don't i would say come up with a project merely because there's a scheme that might fund it if you wouldn't otherwise want to do that work. Now, there can be some exceptions to that, uh, for example, uh, adapting to the coronavirus, if there have been particular uh, funding streams that have come online and uh, people have wanted to react to those and also to do good work. But generally speaking, I think it's good to start with ideas for projects that you want to do and be led by those. See which schemes might fit your ideas rather than which of your ideas will fit schemes. What you can do is adapt an idea that you might want uh, to do uh, to shape it, absolutely. Or you might say, well, my current plan was to do the projects in this order or, or produce the articles in this order. But actually, if there's this funding scheme, I could get access to that archive so I could bring forward that one. So you can adapt the ideas that you have, but uh, don't be driven by somebody else's research agenda. Uh, whether it's a funding council or institutional researchers for the sake of it right? you're better off uh, sticking to your own territory and so with that the question of why is important i, I mentioned that in my interjection in rudely in david's uh, session which is to say always ask yourself why you're submitting to this particular journal not just because it's a good journal right what is it about your work you think fits that would be good to publish it here and particularly the why question is important for people who are reading your application. Almost necessarily, you will be amongst the most invested and most expert people on the project that you're proposing, right? because it's your uh, home territory, it's your favorite subject, it's the thing you've chosen uh, to dedicate three years of your doctorate or your career to. But the people reading it won't be limited to those who know what you're talking about. And so when you're applying for a fellowship, and an academic job, but certainly for fellowships, you need to ask, uh, make the case for why are you the person to do this? Uh, why on this topic? Why should it be at this particular institution? Again, not just I want to be a visiting fellow, but why is it good uh, for you to be at this institution? Why is it good for this institution for you to be there? Why this particular scheme? Are there uh, teaching obligations with it? Are there, um, uh, is it particularly targeted at an underrepresented group of which you remember? Uh, why now and why care and those are two crucial questions always to ask yourself because you know why you care but why should other people <laughs> so is it that this work in one area will offer insights uh, to help us understand the role of judges in developing intellectual property law um why should it be now what's the hook to do it particularly because a lot of research involves tackling relatively eternal questions and uh if you're simply saying I'm revisiting this eternal debate, you're essentially saying my arguments are the best arguments that anyone's ever made on this topic. <laughs> Whereas if you say, oh, actually in the light of the pandemic or because of Brexit or uh, in the light of this important new piece of legislation or Supreme Court decision, here's why we need to revisit this debate. You're helping to give it a hook of why in 2022 uh, it particularly matters. Yeah? So think about the implications and um, remember, that you're not speaking only to specialists. So a good way of thinking about this is uh, what I think of as the dinner party test. So some of my work has been more specialist than others, and I've published in some specialist journals and some uh, in generalist journals. I've also had a piece rejected by the Modern Law Review before. And um, 
I think a good thing to think about is what I call the dinner party test for whether you go for a specialist or generalist journal. So years ago, at the start of my career, I was going to my first international conference. And uh, I was flying out of London and a friend happened to have a party the night before. So I went to a party and uh, everyone else there worked, I think, in finance. But um, so I was this sort of conversational curiosity. And people said, oh, you're an academic, that's sweet. Um, why are you in London if you don't work in London? And uh, I said, oh, well, I'm going to this conference. Said, oh, that's really interesting, an international conference. Uh, what are you presenting? I was like, oh, don't worry about it, it's just sort of to do with judges now. No, we want to, we want to know. It's like, well, no, just like some of my work is, is quite accessible. This, as it happens, is a bit less accessible. And everybody insisted on wanting to know what my article was on. And so I eventually said, which was the uh, use of Roman law in recent English private law decisions of the House of Lords. And that ended the conversation. So uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm happy with this piece, and I'm proud of it, but it's the quintessential specialist piece that's probably harder to uh, entice a wider audience with. So ask yourself, what work are you planning to put forward and how are you explaining it in a way that engages uh, a non-expert audience, still clever academics, but not people who are as invested as you. Because often when people are disappointed, it's because they haven't made the case enough to the right audience. So just a couple of final uh, thoughts and then time for questions. Um, if you are making uh, an application for a visiting fellowship, also true for academic uh, jobs, but uh, you need to make sure that you say what's gonna come out of it. Right? And in annoying academic parlance, that's known as, uh, often referred to as outputs. Um, what pieces are you going to publish? What conference papers? Is it a book? Is it converting your thesis into a book and so on? And here you need to mix uh, temper, ambition and realism. You want to deliver on what you say you're going to do. And it's fine to say this will be setting the scene for a larger project, but here's the one and a half concrete things. It might be uh, a short, shorter specialist piece or a um, uh, and then a feature length article, or it might be just a feature length article or two feature length articles or completing the research. It depends on what the project is, but you need to be clear about what can be expected from it because visiting fellowships want people to uh, credit the visiting fellowship in subsequent publications. And they don't want people just to be there and have a nice time. You can have a very nice time, but being clear about what can be expected to come out of this uh, is important. And that needs to be ambitious, both intellectually, but also in terms of what you will achieve uh, but not overly ambitious in the sense that you're not going to write three books in a three month period, uh, or you're not going to write three uh, MLR worthy articles in a three month period. Better to focus on producing quality over quantity, obviously calibrated to how long the visit is intended to be. Uh, you can do more in a year than you can in, in six months. So then once you are there, this is another bit um, beyond the fact of being a visiting fellow, what can you do? What are the opportunities to get involved? So there might be the chance to do some teaching. That could be a course, or it could just be a guest lecture on uh, undergraduate or master's course, but engaging with students. I think all institutions uh, can do more to involve visiting scholars in the wider educational life of the school beyond research. So that's not to say we're going to get people to do seven tutorial groups uh, throughout the duration of their visit, but um, people are joining the community. And so involving them uh, beyond just the solitary sitting at a desk uh, model is, I think, important. You'll often have to give talks and seminars, but say what you would plan to contribute. Talk to people you know uh, there. Uh, of course, the main focus should be on the research if it's a research fellowship, but say how it's going to connect to the community and your visit will be enriching. And then finally, uh, make sure you're owning your own agenda. Don't be a sorcerer's apprentice uh, following someone else's work. Uh, make sure that you keep the time for you to do the work that you want to be uh, achieving. And then finally, uh, through all of this, whether it's sessions like this, uh, sending emails, uh, asking for advice, uh, contacts, connections you have from uh, attending conferences or at your own institution, all of us have benefited from the advice of people who are a bit more established, a bit older, a bit uh, longer in the game than us. And it's hard to pay back the people who helped uh, you at different stages, but what you can do is pay it forward. So advising people uh, when you're more established, uh, accepting invitations to give virtual talks or, 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 or do them in person. Um, advice is there, and we all know that not everybody has access to the same sorts of advice, so that's why these sorts of initiatives and sessions uh, are really valuable. And as David mentioned, uh, we may all get a lot of emails, it might not always be possible to reply immediately to everything, but we can connect people, 
uh, use Twitter, social media, and LinkedIn to engage. Um, because we all benefit from advice and everything I've ever written has been better for somebody else reading it first. So um, I hope those are some initial thoughts that might be of use. I'll stop uh, sharing my screen now and then happy to uh, hear from any uh, questions that people might have. Thanks, Jamie. That was really useful. So I have a question that I think was essentially answering what you were saying, but I wanted to be clear on something. So um, you spoke about there being a lot of competition for positions and you obviously want to apply for those that are going to be most relevant for you and your research and that you'll be able to contribute to the community and that they run in cycles. Is it that you are allowed to apply for more than one at a time? And I ask this because I know for journals, usually you apply to one and it's an exclusive review process. So I just wanted to clarify if it is OK. Yeah, I, I obviously always check the specific rules uh, with funding councils, you might not be able to be applying for more than one at the same time. But um, as I say, I'm visiting Oxford uh, for a bit and you can apply. Well, they do want to know if you've got one, because okay. one of the things they do, so it might be you can't accept all of them. Right. Uh, because they do want to spread out the opportunities. So particularly say if there's the opportunity to visit three different colleges in three terms, they might not want uh, that because it reduces overall the number of people who can come to visit. So. Um, but yeah, they're looking at other people, right? They're not saying they're only going to have an application from you. <laughs> so um, these are concurrent. So I think certainly with visiting ones, don't overextend yourself because you, know, you, you might get, uh, A, it's hard to do them all well, but also you can't accept all of them. Uh, but if, uh, you know, as long as there's not an express rule prohibiting it, then it's fine. It's different with funding councils. And in any event, especially with funding councils, um, it's hard to keep going on the same project. Some of them do require exclusivity a bit like journals at the same time but of course you can then repurpose it if it's unsuccessful okay and i liked that you talked about also planning what you're going to do with the community in terms of talks and seminars i think that was really good advice um, i can't say i've applied for anything personally at this stage because i need to come up with the project and all of that stuff and i'm getting on top of everything at ue first but i thought that was really good to know what exactly is entailed because clearly it's the research is very important that's key but I do think if you go to a different institution, you do want to interact with the community and you should be contributing something. So I thought that was good advice to know that that should also be considered within your application. I see there's a question from Amy. Let's see. OK, so this is a good question, especially in our context. So, Jamie, I was telling you at the beginning, we are quite a small faculty um, here in St. Augustine. So we do have faculties in Barbados and Jamaica, but obviously we are geographically separate and we kind of run as separate faculties even though we're under one university and so Amy's asking that she's find that she found that's been difficult to meet people who would be interested in discussing her research um, if it's not within their area so she asks what advice do you have for someone who is trying to find people to bounce ideas off when the faculty is quite small and the research is already quite diverse mm -hmm. so uh if we hope that the pandemic is now uh, easing this potential to get back to what academia used to be like, then in-person conferences are a great way to meet people, particularly, I think, those that are organised by learner societies and organisations. So uh, the Society of Legal Scholars, for example, uh, Social Legal Studies Association. Um, it can also be true of, of general subject uh, fields as well, um, because everybody was at their first conference once. <laughs> and so um, you do find people who are willing to talk to you. The other thing you can do is contact people in your field whose work you admire. And uh, framing it as I'm at a, a small law school where I'm the one IP lawyer and, and there aren't that many connections, I've got supportive colleagues generally, but it'd be really useful to be put in touch with other people um, is fine, right? If you say, I'm talking to you because I think it will enhance my career to have you as a contact, that's not the right way to do it but framing it as um i attended this talk and people suggested that it's not uh, unheard of or weird to uh, reach out and, and say um introduce myself that's what i'm doing uh, and you know, some people won't reply but some people will <laughs> and uh you know, talk to the senior colleagues in your uh, faculty as well because they might not be in your field but they might know somebody who is and they can put you in, in touch um, or they'll know someone who does know people who, who can help with that kind of thing as well so um, that would be my uh, main suggestion, I think, of, of just it takes a bit of courage. I'm not underestimating that. Uh, and it's, it's um, kind of presenting a vulnerability, but, but people will 
understand that and then I think hopefully be um, supportive. In fact, I uh, am very lucky to collaborate with um, a colleague at Singapore Management University, uh, Yip Man, we've uh, written a few things together now. And we first got in touch because I read something that she wrote that was very good and bore upon something I was writing. So I sent her a note and I thought that was a bit weird, but then it blossomed into a valuable collaboration. So um, yeah, so I think trying to make context. Also, I do really think social media, Twitter and uh, LinkedIn sometimes, but, but I think particularly Twitter just for seeing what's going on in your field can be really useful. Okay, that's really good to know. I will be applying for the SLS in September. Well, I will apply for that, but I'll hopefully be there in September and get to mm -hmm. reacquaint myself Deadlines with many people. Weeks, I think. Well, I did my abstract, but we're applying for um, a panel, so Justin was reviewing it, but that's a different conversation. Um, point is, I agree that going to conferences and stuff can be very helpful. Um, Amy, I'm not sure which stage you're at as yet. I know for students, it can be a bit more difficult in terms of the financing for travel and whatnot. So I'm not sure if you are one of our LLMs or PhDs, but they there is funding available from some conferences that will help out students. So you could look out for that as well. And I find people generally are very um, helpful and friendly when you approach them. I agree with Jamie, it does take a bit of confidence because when you're seeing the academics whose names you've read, that can be a bit intimidating. Um, but I find people usually are very friendly and will speak to you and everything. So as he said, you can feel free to reach out. And then I think by making those contacts, you'll probably learn about opportunities if it is you plan to continue in academia um, about the visiting fellowships that Jamie has told us about today. So I think uh, it's really good to start talking to people and people I realize are just normal people, even though they might be very accomplished. Usually they're quite friendly and nice and happy to talk. So I've had good experiences so far. Um, and again, I must thank Jamie and David for their time today, because if they weren't nice, friendly people, I mean, they're very busy. So it was great for them to give their time to speak to everybody today. Um, does anyone else have questions? You can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand. Thank you so much, David, for being here today. And I hope your next event goes well. And we appreciate your time and insights. Bye. Thank you. OK, so I know we're just on time, so we can take one more question. Or I can ask my own personal question. Um, so Jamie, in terms of looking at different institutions and different opportunities, I know that there's a lot that would have to go into um, thinking about which opportunities would best suit your research profile and how you could advance that university as well. But are there any fellowships that are known and again, I, I probably should probably do the research and find this out online, but I'm just wondering off the top of your head, are there any fellowships that are known to be maybe for earlier career researchers versus more senior people? Or is it just that it's open in general to everybody? Yeah, I mean, so um, when it comes to jobs, one of the good things about UK academia is that all the jobs are put in one place, jobs.ac.uk. So every job I've ever got, I saw on jobs that they're sometimes advertised elsewhere as well but they'll all be put in that one place you'll sometimes see visiting fellowships also advertised there but sometimes it's just a question of going through law schools you might want to visit or university you might want to visit and seeing what they offer because they don't necessarily advertise them in the broader um sense sometimes you need a faculty member to sponsor you and sort of get to co-side so uh i think most institutions will have opportunities for people of all career stages to um, apply. Whether there's funding might depend because some places only have funding for to bring in most senior professors or, or, or um, whatever it might be. But equally, it is possible to get funding at um, the McCormick uh, Visiting Fellowships at um, Edinburgh, which I did a few years ago, um, is a great scheme and they sort of mid-career, um, especially do sometimes have senior people as well but it's it, it includes that so it's a question of just looking at what the options are i think most cases it's a sort of tiered system at most institutions um uh with sometimes the question of how much the funding is is, is the main thing okay that's great great to know thank you so much jamie this has been very insightful um, i know we are at the end of our time so i just want to say thank you so much this has been great i mean for everybody here but also for me personally who is interested in was interested in learning about this topic um i think it's something that a lot of our attendants were very interested in as well so thank you so much and everyone this is our last seminar for the semester so we will resume in september and i will put out the schedule for that so uh, thank you, Jamie, and I see some thanks coming in the chat as well. And hopefully I will see you at SLS in September. Great. Thank you very much, Emma, for organizing this. I can see it's been a really valuable um, set of sessions. So uh, good luck to everybody. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone.
Bye. Bye.